I like that. I want more of that. Hey crew, I've got the key to that 23 Chevy Camaro ZL1. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first, let's check it out. It looks on the inside and outside. Now, the first thing you're thinking is, surely he forgot to say ZL1 1LE, but in fact, I didn't, because this is a standard ZL1 that the owner, Curly Silwanis, who, by the way, you should definitely go follow on Instagram. I'll put his handle right here. It's ZL1 Curly, modified to look just like the 1LE. So it has that massive front splitter it's got those protruding dive planes. It has the matte black on the hood. And from the factory, the carbon fiber insert. He also blacked out the Z and L of the ZL1 badge. And this one is painted in rapid blue, which if you know me at all, you know I love this color. It's the same on my CT5V Blackwing, which I brought along with me to take a photo of them together. Now, one of the giveaways that you are looking at a regular ZL1, not a 1LE, is that the Brembo brake calipers are in silver, not red, something Curly plans on changing very soon. These standard wheels are dark gray forged alloys wrapped in Goodyear Eagle F1 summer tires, sized 285 section fronts and 305 at the back. Now, I'm not saying I felt a pang of jealousy looking at the low slung aggressive silhouette of the Camaro ZL1 alongside my more traditional sedan bodied CT5 Blackwing. But that's precisely what I'm saying. This thing looks so mean and it's got the gloss black for the lower sills, matte black for the door mirrors and roof. At the back to complete the 1LE look, Curly added the carbon fiber wing rising up over the darkened clear LED taillights and turn signals and an upgraded Corsa NPP variable valve quad exhaust system jutting from outside the gloss black diffuser portion. This car looks sinister. And I can get on board with adding the 1LE look, but retaining the standard car's magnetic ride control. What do you guys think? Do you like the 1LE styling aggression, or do you prefer the more covert standard ZL1? Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up and looking inside at this black interior like every ZL1 model with Recaro sport bucket seats that have leather borders, red contrast stitching, suede inserts with ZL1 badges, power adjustments, heating and ventilation. There are aluminum accented foot pedals. He's got them all weather floor mats. Camaro is on the tread plate on the doors. There's suede up top for the insert and armrest, harder plastics on other portions of the door, two one-touch windows, power adjusting, not power folding door mirrors, two positions of memory for the seat, and a Bose sound system. Hit this button down here to pop up the trunk lid. Well, I mean, just barely release it. You then lift it up and find nine cubic feet of space with not a very large opening. If you do need more room, then the rear seats fold as one unit with a release from inside the car. There's no handle to close the lid, so just gently move it on down. To get to the back seats, and yes, there are back seats, pull on these levers. The seat will angle forward, but not power slide on its own. So you have to go down here and hold that button until there's a decent enough access point. You're gonna make me climb back there, aren't you? Okay, now here in the back, this seat isn't even where I would have it at six feet tall. It would give me about that much of leg room, but that doesn't even matter because this is the headroom situation. I'm so terribly far forward that I don't think a kid older than six would actually fit back here. You should just use this for storage and for wirelessly charging your smartphone, I guess. Let's get back to the front. Here in the front seat, I'm gonna close up the door and listen for the sound of a respectable thud, little vibration there, not too bad. The steering wheel is suede wrapped and not overly thick in the hands. It's got a flat bottom to it and plasticky paddles on the back for this 10-speed transmission. There is a digital instrument cluster. I'll see if I can prime that up here. And it is slightly reconfigurable with analog gauges left and right for the tack and speedo. There is a head-up display. We've got harder plastics up top, some suede wrapping here on the passenger side, and then an eight-inch touchscreen infotainment system that's really fast to respond and has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Below that's a volume knob and tuner controls. There's some fake carbon fiber trim around the infotainment system and on this console portion to adjust the temperature inside the cabin. Turn these massive air vent dials, which is just kind of fun. There's suede wrapping around the gear selector that says ZL1 on top. You've got your drive mode selector. 
but a lot of hard, cheap plastic in visible places in this cabin. Leather is topping the console, and inside is not a lot of storage with two USB-A ports. Thank goodness there is a digital rearview mirror when the car is on, because your naked eye visibility inside the Camaro ZL1 is terrible. There is standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic, thankfully. Headroom is halfway decent because the seat lowers so much, and there's a sunroof option in the standard ZL1, not in the 1LE. This cabin overall has some sportier touches like the suede wrapping and the Recaro Sport Bucket seats with decent convenience features. Not a whole lot of traditional luxuries though. Looking at you, hard cheap plastics. Now we have to see how the Camaro ZL1 10 speed drives. All right, let's fire it up. Oh, what a noise. And the aftermarket coarse exhaust just amplifying the intensity. Hello, cabin crew. Thank you for joining me for this drive in the 23 Chevy Camaro ZL1. Our drive mode, selected here, shall be tour to begin. And then I'll pull back on the gear selector to bring us into reverse, prompting on the screen a high resolution backup camera system with trajectory lines. No other views though, like we have in my Blackwing right there, which I don't often get to just wave goodbye to my cars and starting a review, but I'm not cheating on you. I'm just borrowing your sibling for a short period of time. Don't be mad. Anyway, so no surround camera view, which on that car we've got like wheel shots, which is really convenient when you're pulling into a garage space. So you're sure you're not scraping up anything important, but alas, we don't have that here. So I'll just back on out. Go down into drive and then begin with a turning radius test. Straightened, now cranked. Ooh, I am so impressed with that. Maybe I'm extra impressed because the turning circle on my car is so abysmal. How did GM get that so wrong and this so right? Now we've got to do the world famous horn test. Ooh, it's just a classic horn sound. You move it or you lose it. And the turn signal sound. so very nostalgic like I've heard that signal sound a million different times in a million different cars and here it is again now what I haven't heard is this LT4 motor with precisely this acoustic profile with that Corsa active valve exhaust there's so much rumble here even in tour and even at just partial throttle which has this baritone to it that my CT5 Blackwing just doesn't which matches the character of the car I am familiar with this motor this 6.2 liter supercharged V8 here in the ZL1 makes 650 horsepower and 650 pound-feet of torque that is down 18 horses and 9 pound-feet compared to my Blackwing but the ZL1 weighs a little more than 200 pounds less so it's more than made up for it in power to weight ratio. And the 10 speed automatic that communicates that power to the rear tires is very smooth here about town. Gently working its way between gears, imperceptibly in the background, while in tour still providing enough throttle response so you can easily, gracefully make your way up to speed. You just don't notice the transmission, and that's the best thing I can say about it right now. We'll see how it responds to more aggressive maneuvers later on, but right now, round down, this is great. As is the magnetic ride control, the adaptive damper system that is shared with my Blackwing, but tuned very differently. So in the Blackwing, it's so very compliant. It's a true Cadillac riding experience. It does dial up when you change the drive modes in that car and gets firmer, but it's not on the same level as here in the ZL1. It's firmer in this car, it's sharper, it gives you that sports car feel, even in tour drive mode. 
But my goodness, I need to be very emphatic about this. The ride from the magnetic ride control system compared to the Multimatic spool valve damper system in the 1LE is night and day. Because while the magnetic rod control of the ZL1 is more energetic than in my CT5 Blackwing, it's nowhere near the level of punishment day in and day out that the Multimatic spool valve damper system in the 1LE provides. I was, if you haven't seen that review, go watch it now just for context. I was hopping, literally hopping. I think I got air in my seat over certain blemishes in the road in that car to the point that I was thinking, daily driving this, maybe I would put up with it just for the aggression on a track or a great canyon road, but boy, that would be a sacrifice because it just was so brittle. And I use that word carefully. It was a brittle riding car. I kind of get why Curly chose the magnetic ride control in this car while getting all the aero bits and the, the look of the 1LE. You just don't have to deal with the daily drive sacrifice. And as other around town or commuter comforts go, the Brembo brakes are so very easy to modulate. Come up to that smooth stop. The seats are highly ergonomic. And with the height adjustability that I mentioned in the interior walk around and the tilt and telescope of this wheel, most drivers are gonna be able to find a comfortable seating position for themselves. Granted, the bolsters are not adjustable, so if you've got a very wide body, then uh, you may need to test fit yourself in the seats before committing to the ZL1. Now, one thing that did surprise me was me thinking, all right, the standard ZL1 is not the track focused 1LE with the spool valve dampers and maybe the six speed manual. This car with the 10 speed and the magnetic ride control is gonna be much more of a passive daily drive. But what I found is that the car will tram line in certain grooves in the road. So you have to be attentive with the steering. And then when you are putting in some steering effort, even in the tour drive mode, it does have resistance there. So you need to be attentive to even your casual motoring experience. That doesn't mean it's a chore like the 1LE could be, but it does mean that you're always aware of the weapon that you are driving in. And precisely what kind of weapon are we dealing with, Miles? Well, I intend to find out. I'm gonna go into the sport drive mode now, which immediately downshifts on the 10 speed and perks up the throttle response. Oh my gosh, to deliver such a kickback and launch experience. The supercharger wine, all oh, from that aftermarket Corsa cold air intake. I'm very jealous because my CT5 Blackwing doesn't have nearly the amount of supercharger wine I want. <laughs> oh, it's so very good. And then the heartiness of that V8 note taking over is wonderful. I'm just now trying to play with the acoustic profile here, see if I can eke out the supercharger one before the Corsa Thunder takes over. Not an easy thing to do. I kind of have to really just, oh. Oh, I like that. I want more of that. That's theatrical and wonderful. <laughs> but yes, really, if you want to get more supercharger one, you kind of just have to go full throttle. <laughs> as if that's a chore and then on the other end of things the pounding of overrun is just such a one two punch from this car now i gotta try manual mode so i'm gonna move the selector over and utilize these battles which are so very plasticky take half a sec for this shift but not a terribly long amount of time I 
The upshifts are very fast, actually. Ooh, that was interesting. As I was pulling the paddle, and right before I upshifted, which I pulled the paddle like at least 200 RPM early, I got the cutout. Makes me think maybe the needle on the tachometer is a little delayed. We're, we're actually getting to 6,500 RPM and I'm going to pull the paddle, but it's past it at that point. I gotta work around that one, I guess. Pull it early at like maybe 6,000? Yeah, no cut out there. All right, pull it by 6,200 and you're fine. Wait any longer and it will cut out. But Redline Schmedline, let's see about launch control. To activate that in the ZL1, we're first gonna go into the track drive mode, and then I'm gonna hit the traction control button twice. This will put us into performance traction management, and you can select from these options. We wanna be at least in sport one or sport two. It's also race, we'll do sport one. And then from here, and I confirm, I'm going to go into the options screen, and prepare for launch control, I'll then hit the right button, and you can set a custom launch RPM, we'll just do 2000 here, and then holding my foot on the brake, pin the throttle, and let go of the brake. Now we're just about ready for a real world zero to 60 test in the 1LE. I've got my race box set up here to record, giving it full brake pressure, full throttle, let go of the brake, struggling for traction, finally got it, and there's 60 and 4.5, Three, four seconds. Needs more grip, not more power. <laughs> now, independent tests like car and driver did get a ZL1 10 speed to 60 in ideal conditions in just 3.8 seconds. And I myself got the 1LE with the six speed manual to 60 in four seconds flat. So that just goes to show the real world nature of this test. You can expect that turn up at any stoplight, you'll get to 60 in right around four seconds. But that's all just a tease for the ZL1's most alluring attribute, it's handling. Because when we're in track mode, that magnetic ride control flattens out unnecessary body motions, perks up that response of the throttle, the Brembo brakes do their job to cut speed, the supercharged motor does its job to provide a healthy amount of power out of a corner, thanks in part to the limited slip differential, we're getting that power to the ground, 10 speed doing its thing, staying in the right gear here in track drive mode. <laughs> oh, it inhales corners. It just does. The steering is also talkative and true to your inputs, yielding the direction of the vehicle precisely as you expect it to. Lots of grip here. Perhaps not the same level of energy or enthusiasm on turn in as the 1LE package. But I mean, the difference here on a curvy road is so hard to discern. That would really only become more apparent on a racetrack. Here, this car feels very fast, <laughs> very fast. Oh, and it makes it so much more painful. Painful that the Camaro is dying. At least the internal combustion one. Who knows what EV version of it will resurface after the 24 model year. But for it to be leaving on this height, you just have to wonder what, what could be, what could have been future internal combustion versions of this car. At least we can appreciate that this one is memorable. <laughs> and that's going to lead into my miles per hour word of the day, which for the 23 Chevy Camaro ZL1 is revelry, meaning joyful merrymaking. Because how else do you describe that every single day? It's just revelrous. And I am in firm support.
Before we dive into pricing and competition, let's review the top speed and fuel economy. Top speed for the ZL1 is 191 miles per hour, and the fuel economy is 13 MPG in the city, 21 on the highway, and 16 combined. The starting price for the 23 ZL1 is $70,000, and Curly's Monroney says 76 grand for this car, but we know with all the 1LE exterior treatments, it would be more. Now, when thinking about competitors, there are a few different ways you could approach this one. We could go for just strict muscle cars like the Dodge Challenger Hellcat Widebody, which is $77,000 to start. It makes 717 horsepower, gets to 60 in 3.9 seconds, has a top speed of 196 miles per hour and fuel economy of 16 combined. Or you can move slightly more towards the sports car realm with the Ford Mustang Dark Horse. That one starts at $61,000. It makes 500 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.2 seconds, has a top speed of 166 miles per hour, and a fuel economy of 17 combined. Or move firmly into the sports car category with the Toyota GR Supra 3.0 that starts at $58,000, makes 382 horsepower, gets to 60 in 3.9 seconds, has a top speed of 161 miles per hour, and fuel economy of 21 combined. I think that despite the Camaro's muscle car roots and that V8 noise, the ZL1 at least is firmly, my goodness, calm down, firmly in the sports car echelon of dynamic performance. And so yes, the Challenger Hellcat could be cross shop, but they're gonna give you a very different driving experience once the road stops being like this and starts being like this. The Ford Mustang Dark Horse, I'll admit, I have not driven the new Mustang, but I've driven so many versions of its predecessor. And yes, that car is going to have a more modern interior, better visibility, and uh, perhaps better daily driving compliance, ride compliance, even than this magnetic ride control version of the ZL1. But it's just not going to deliver in the same way with the steering feel and the cornering accuracy and energy of the ZL1. And then the GR Supra. Excellent, excellent to drive sports car. But if we're getting to curb appeal wow factor and just once again, the theater with the Corsa exhaust, then the ZL1 just takes the cake for me. But which would you guys choose? Would you have the Ford Mustang Dark Horse? Would you get the Dodge Challenger Hellcat Widebody? Would you have the GR Supra 3.0 or this Chevy Camaro ZL1? Let me know in the comments, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV drive review. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel. And once again, I want to thank Curly at ZL1 Curly on Instagram. Go follow him there for letting me review his Camaro ZL1. You've done a great job with it. I would get almost your exact car, but with the six-speed manual. That would be the one difference. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you again next time.